Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Dark apparitions that reveal themselves while you're sleeping are scary enough. But of all of these shadow people that visit you at night, the Hat Man may be the creepiest. Unlike other shadow people, this mysterious figure is always seen wearing a hat, often described as a top hat, fedora, or cowboy hat. Witnesses from all over the world have shared eerily similar stories of their encounters, describing the Hat Man as a tall, shadowy figure with glowing red eyes who tends to appear during times of emotional distress. The history of shadow people dates back to ancient times, with mentions in the Quran and beliefs in ancient Egypt, Rome, and Greece. Shadow people are described as dark silhouettes with human shapes that flicker in and out of peripheral vision. Some believe these beings are interdimensional, intelligent entities, while others think they are linked to sleep paralysis. The Hat Man, in particular, has been associated with negative emotions and is thought by some to be a demon or alien being. Despite the many theories, the true nature of shadow people and the Hat Man remains a chilling mystery. Who or what is the Hat Man? And what does he want? I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… He was a charismatic activist and local celebrity who counted the elite of Philadelphia among his friends. But behind closed doors, Ira Einhorn's relationship with his girlfriend, Holly Maddox, was fraught with abuse, control, and ultimately murder. The shocking discovery of Holly's body in a trunk in Einhorn's apartment was only the beginning of the hunt for the man they would eventually call the Unicorn Killer. On May 1, 1897, Louisa Lutgert, the wife of a prominent Chicago sausage maker, mysteriously vanished. The last sighting of her was with her husband Adolf as they walked into a sausage factory. This chilling disappearance not only shocked the city, but also caused a notable decline in sausage sales that summer. Gee, I wonder why. Centuries of worship and tragedy have left behind more than just memories in some churches. They've also left behind spirits, some holy, some not from ghostly priests and weeping brides to mysterious mists and phantom lights, there are hauntings that linger in these ancient sanctuaries. What eerie tales are hidden within the walls of the world's oldest and most haunted churches? In June 2006, Gilbert Gilman vanished without a trace during a short walk in Olympic National Park. Despite an extensive search and numerous theories, no evidence of his fate has ever been found. Was he a victim of foul play, or did he choose to disappear? But first, unlike most Shadow People figures, the Hat Man, this tall, dark being, often appears during times of emotional turmoil. With accounts from all over the world, questions continue to be asked about his origin. Is he supernatural? Interdimensional? Just our imagination? demonic or extraterrestrial? What is the Hat Man? And what are his motives? We begin there. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more 
at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. It's been discovered that there are different classes of shadow people, and the terrifying Hat Man is without a doubt the most terrifying among them. He's been spotted all over the world, and according to people who've shared their stories, the Hat Man has apparently been around for a while. Before we look specifically at the Hat Man, though, we should probably explain a bit more about shadow people in general, as the two are usually compared to each other but not necessarily the same. Shadow people have been scaring people for thousands of years, but what are they? These humanoid figures are often believed to be supernatural spirits or entities that manifest as dark shadows. The history of the shadow people dates back as early as the 600s AD, with creepy shadow people stories emerging from all parts of the world. The tales are eerily similar, describing dark, human-like figures that appear in the periphery of one's vision or even during moments of sleep paralysis. Shadow people are described as dark, humanoid figures that lack any discernible features. According to Heidi Hollis in her book The Secret War, shadow people are dark silhouettes with human shapes and profiles that flicker in and out of peripheral vision. Their emergence in popular culture has been fueled by paranormal investigators who have dedicated their lives to researching and finding these mysterious beings. The most common form a shadow person takes is the classic shadow being. This figure is described as a dark, inorganic, phantom-like bipedal figure that looks like a shadow but doesn't seem to have a fully human form. These entities often feel very masculine and oppressive, like something beyond human comprehension. Psychic medium Natalia Kuna describes these figures as being tall, about seven feet in height, though they can change sizes and shapes. Sometimes their limbs seem unusually long and occasionally their fingers are visible. Some believe that shadow people use their dark form as camouflage, taking on a rough humanoid shape to blend in with us. Others report seeing shadow people with glowing red or green eyes or even wearing hats, like the Hat Man, who often appears in a cape or a trench coat with a top hat, fedora, or cowboy hat. Natalia Kuna describes shadow people as conscious, intelligent, interdimensional beings. She writes that they can dematerialize quickly and shapeshift into other forms, such as a cat, dog, rodent, spider, insect, or other creature. Kuna believes the Hat Man is an intelligent consciousness from another dimension or time-space reality, possibly the future. Author Michael Kinsella also supports this idea, suggesting that shadow people are extra-dimensional inhabitants of another universe in his book Legend Tripping Online, Supernatural Folklore and the Search for Ong's Hat. The mythology of shadow people dates back to early 600 AD. Ancient Egyptians believed in shadow people calling them the Kelbut. Romans thought these beings came from the underworld, while Greeks believed shadow people were literal shadows of themselves which they often gave up to Zeus as a gift. Despite these differences, all these cultures had a common belief. Shadow people were part of both the real world and the metaphysical one. In ancient Egypt, shadow people often acted on behalf of humans in the spirit world, sometimes for good and sometimes for evil. This dual role highlights the complex nature of these entities in ancient beliefs. Dr. Shelley Adler wrote a book that connects seeing shadow people to sleep paralysis. In Sleep Paralysis, Nightmares, Nosopos, and the Mind-Body Connection, she explains that people who suffer from sleep paralysis may perceive a shadowy or indistinct shape approaching or standing over them during an episode. This suggests that these visions might not be supernatural but could be perceptions within the brain. Neuroscientist Bayland Jalal and V. S. Ramakandran also believe these hallucinations might have neurological explanations. Here's a personal account of an encounter with a shadow person from the lineup. While lying there unable to sleep, I became aware of a presence and suddenly and silently a figure moved through our bedroom door and proceeded to our bed. 
Then, rounding the corner of our bed, it took up a fixed position at the foot of our bed. I was aware that this entity was conscious of us and was intently watching us as we lay there. The entity can best be described as something that had the appearance of black smoke or a shadow. However, it was more material than either of these, but less material than a real person. The most odd thing about this is my lack of fear. Although I was acutely aware of this being and the fact that it was not of this earth, as we perceive it, it did not seem to arouse any fear response in me. I would say it aroused a feeling that would fit somewhere between creepy, awed, and curiosity, especially considering the fact that it was as aware of me as I was aware of it. After some time, I almost convinced myself that I was imagining it, but then I became aware of the fact that my wife was no longer breathing like she was asleep, but was breathing almost silently. I then said, Honey, are you awake? To which she answered, Yes. And then I said, Do you see anything? Expecting her reply to be, What do you mean? But much to my surprise, she said, You mean that thing standing at the foot of the bed? At this time, I did become somewhat nervous. We laid there for about 10 minutes, and then it was gone. It just, over a period of about 10 seconds, became less solid, and our perception of its presence became weaker until it just wasn't there anymore. Then it was as if it had never been there. Nothing like this has happened since, and the only evidence it ever existed is my wife's and my memories of it. In 2003, radio DJ and shadow person expert George Nuri invited Heidi Hollis and Matt Moneymaker, a noted Bigfoot hunter, onto his radio show, Coast to Coast AM, to discuss shadow people and the hat man. Nuri mentioned reports of shadow people attempting to jump on their chest and choke people, suggesting that shadow people can make contact with the physical realm. Lena Townsend, a registered metaphysical practitioner, has studied instances where people felt antagonized by shadow people. She believes these entities might have demons attached to them. However, she doesn't think that all shadow people are malevolent or awful. Kuna claims that most shadow figures are parasitic, malevolent, or evil, although people sometimes encounter shadow people with neutral auras. Some describe shadow people as benevolent and guardian-like. However, shadow people with red or green glowing eyes are believed to be extremely evil humans who have passed and transformed into this dark, ominous form to continue their malevolent ways. They are dark force incarnate entities. Townsend herself agrees that not all shadow people are evil, but the ones that are definitely are. She says this is because shadow people feed off the energy they're given. If their spirits are stuck because of a negative experience, they can become evil while others living in a positive environment won't feel motivated to lash out. Hollis told Nori on an episode of Coast to Coast AM in 2006 that shadow people can be repelled by various means, including invoking the name of Jesus. Kuna agrees on her website, stating, just saying Jesus' name can be enough. They are instantly repelled and banished. The light is too strong. Kuna also provided several alternative methods to banish shadow people, such as saying protective prayers, like the Archangel Michael prayer protection, being vocal and demanding they leave, playing loud music, using sage to cleanse the area and oneself, or performing a banishing ritual. In 2015, director Rodney Asher premiered his sleep paralysis documentary, The Nightmare, at the Sundance Film Festival. It features eight people who suffer from sleep paralysis and recreates their experiences with professional actors. Many of the encounters involved Shadow People and The Hat Man, played by Stephen Yvette. Shadow People have been a hot topic in popular culture for years. An episode of The Twilight Zone in 1985 called The Shadow Man depicted a teenage boy discovering the man in the hat living under his bed. The boy learns that while shadow people can kill humans, they do not harm those whose beds they live under. In 2007, David Wong released a novel called John Dies at the End, where shadow people had the power to erase humans from existence. Years later, it was developed into an indie film. In 2013, the horror movie Shadow People was released, based on true events from a sleep study conducted in the 1970s where patients were visited by shadow people in their sleep. 
Shadow people remain one of the most mysterious and terrifying phenomena. From ancient mythology to modern personal encounters, these dark figures have captured human imagination and fear for centuries. Whether they are interdimensional beings, demons, or products of our minds, shadow people continue to be a subject of intrigue and horror. As we seek to understand these shadowy entities, we must rely on the experiences and stories of those who have encountered them, keeping an open mind to the many possibilities that lie in the shadows. Author and self-proclaimed shadow people expert Heidi Hollis mentions that shadow people are alien beings in her book The Secret War. More specifically, she believes the man in the hat to be extraterrestrial. Some theorists suggest that the hat man's hat could be a form of disguise to cover an unusually shaped head that might look alien, or it could be some kind of otherworldly technology or protective device. Some believe the hat man belongs to an alien species known as the Greys, which are commonly associated with extraterrestrial encounters. The hat man is a completely dark figure, like other shadow people, but he stands out because he always wears a hat. Some people say they see him in old-fashioned clothing, a long trench coat or cape, and he often has glowing red eyes. Reports also mention that he carries a gold watch attached by a chain to his belt and occasionally looks at it. This mysterious figure has been seen by people all over the world, and his appearance tends to coincide with periods of intense stress or emotional upheaval. People who have encountered the Hat Man describe him in similar ways. He is always a dark, shadowy figure wearing a hat, standing at least six feet tall. Many stories share a common theme. The Hat Man tends to stay longer than other shadow people, often watching from the corner of the room, bending over someone while they sleep or even appearing in mirrors. Unlike other shadow people, the Hat Man seems to have a more solid form. He sometimes floats above the ground or walks away when he leaves instead of simply vanishing. In some cases, the Hat Man has been known to attack people. Victims have reported feeling like they were being choked, experiencing burning sensations in their chests or tingling on their scalps. These attacks are terrifying, but even more disturbing is his tendency to just watch. This passive presence, combined with his solid form, makes him uniquely unsettling among shadow people. The Hat Man often appears in places filled with negative emotions, such as homes where there have been domestic abuse, fighting, or depression. Some people believe he is a demon sent to collect souls for hell. Others think he might be feeding off the negative energy around him. Author and shadow people expert Heidi Hollis shared a story about a German soldier who saw the Hat Man and was told he was Scratch, an old nickname for the devil himself. Another story involves a suicidal man who saw the Hat Man in a hospital. The Hat Man disappeared quickly, but not before saying, I almost had you. Some scientists believe that sleep paralysis, a sleep disorder caused by a disturbed REM sleep cycle, might explain sightings of shadow people and the Hat Man. During sleep paralysis, people are fully awake but unable to move. They may also experience hypnagogic hallucinations, seeing things like shadow people or the Hat Man while they are trapped between being asleep and awake. These hallucinations can be extremely scary, especially since the person experiencing them cannot move. But this doesn't explain those reports, such as the one mentioned earlier, of two people seeing the Hat Man or shadow person at the same time. Not all encounters with the Hat Man can be easily explained by sleep paralysis. Many people see the Hat Man when they are fully awake, which suggests that sleep paralysis might not be the only explanation for this phenomenon. The Hat Man can appear at any time of day in any location, but many encounters happen in bedrooms or basements. Since basements are often dark and scary places to begin with, it's no surprise that the Hat Man is frequently seen there. Bedrooms are another common location because many people see the Hat Man when they are about to go to sleep or have just woken up or are already asleep. Many people have shared their personal stories of encountering the Hat Man. Former Reddit user Strangely Dazed shared their experience. My now ex-boyfriend always talked about these shadow people. He saw the top Hat Man and the man in the fedora. 
He always said the top hat man came to warn him of awful things that were going to happen. I, of course, thought he was a psycho and dismissed it. Two months later, I started to see the man in the hat next to our bed. He would lean over me. Anyways, my boyfriend ended up violently assaulting several girls. I read somewhere that he may show up if you are in the presence of an evil person or a dangerous environment. I also saw a different shadow man in the middle of the road in the car at night with him. I explained his appearance to my boyfriend. He explained immediately that this man came when death occurred. Ironically, I went to a doctor's visit the next day and was informed I had a miscarriage last night. Since we broke up, I haven't seen shadow people since. Redditor Their Eyes Upon You shared, I saw him at 18 years old in my room after a particularly traumatic experience. I woke up at an incredibly late hour, probably 2, 3 a.m. I didn't check, but something was off. I was speaking in a language I've never heard. I was speaking to what I can only describe as a young girl or something with the body type of a young girl, perhaps 14, in a dress. I couldn't make out her features, but I could make out her eyes and her mouth, which could only be described as sharp-looking, like a human piranha or something. She was whispering something in my ear, and I was replying in this strange language. But it wasn't just this shadow girl. My bed was surrounded by tall, dark figures which I could not make out the features of, perhaps four of them not counting the girl. They sat motionless and watched me, but the most striking figure was a tall man in a wide-brimmed hat standing in the corner of my room. I could feel as if he was amused, no, more amused than the others. Each time the girl whispered in my ear, I would let out a reply of which I didn't understand, and the man in the hat would be delighted. You'd think that one would be scared of this sort of encounter, but it felt familiar. I felt rather warm, as if I were surrounded by old friends or family. There are many theories regarding what shadow people actually are and why humans see them, and the hat man may have a similar explanation. Perhaps he is an interdimensional being, visiting humanity from another dimension and only partially visible since he's on a different vibration than we are. He could also be an astral projection, the shadow of a person who is currently traveling out of their human body. A demon is certainly a possibility, based on all the negative feelings people feel around him. Other theories about the existence of the Hat Man include aliens, time travelers, and ghosts, as well as just the wild imaginations of the witnesses. Currently, there's no scientific method to test any of the ideas. So for now, the hat man remains a very creepy mystery. Whether he is a figment of our imaginations, a visitor from another realm, or something else entirely, the hat man continues to intrigue and terrify those who encounter him. Up next, on May 1, 1897, Louisa Lutgert, the wife of a prominent Chicago sausage maker, mysteriously vanished. The last sighting of her was with her husband Adolf as they walked into his sausage factory. This chilling disappearance not only shocked the city, but also caused a notable decline in sausage sales that summer. Gee, I wonder why. Plus, in 2006, Gilbert Gilman vanished without a trace during a short walk in Olympic National Park. Despite an extensive search and numerous theories, no evidence of his fate has ever been found. Was he a victim of foul play, or did he choose to disappear? These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. 
You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. On May 1st, 1897, Louisa Lutgert, the wife of one of Chicago's premier businessmen and sausage makers, vanished without a trace. She was last seen in the company of her husband Adolf. They walked across the street from the Lutgert home and into the sausage factory. Her disappearance and probably murder caused a sensation in Chicago, especially when word leaked out about where she was last seen. It became the only crime in the city's history that actually affected the sales of a food item for an entire summer. Adolf Ludgert was a German immigrant who came to America after the Civil War. He lived for a time in Quincy, Illinois, and then came to Chicago in 1872, where he pursued several trades, including farming and leather tanning. Eventually, he started a wholesale liquor business near Dominic Street and later turned to sausage making, where he found his greatest success. After finding out that his German-style sausages were quite popular in Chicago, he built a sausage plant in 1894 at the southwest corner of Hermitage and Diversey. It would be there where the large and boisterous German would achieve his greatest success – and his shocking infamy. Ludgert was regarded as an unhappy and restless man. He had been widowed in 1877 and left with two sons to raise, one who died young. Two months after his first wife's death, he married again, built his new sausage factory and a new home for his bride across the street from it. But this did little to curb his restlessness. He made friends but had many enemies, and rumor had it that he was carrying on affairs with women who lived in the neighborhood. Lutgert's second wife was Louise Bicknies, a pretty, much younger woman who was a former servant from the Fox River Valley. They met by chance and Lutgert was immediately taken with her, entranced by her diminutive stature and tiny frame. She was less than five feet tall and looked almost childlike next to her burly husband. As a wedding gift, he gave her a unique, heavy gold ring with her initials inscribed inside. He had no idea at the time that this ring would later be his undoing. After less than three years of business in the new factory, Lutgert's finances began to fail. Even though he was turning out large quantities of sausages, Lutgert found that he could not meet his supplier's costs. Instead of trying to reorganize his finances, though, he and his business advisor, William Charles, made plans to expand. They attempted to secure more capital to enlarge the factory. But by April 1897, the scheme had all fallen apart. Lutgert was deep in depression, and his failing took a terrible toll on his marriage. Neighbors frequently heard the couple arguing, and their disagreements became so heated that Lutgert eventually moved his bedroom from the house to a small office inside the factory. Soon after, Louisa found out that her husband was having an affair with the family's maid, Mary Simmerling, who also happened to be Louisa's niece. She was enraged at this news, and this new scandal got the attention of the people in the neighborhood who were already gossiping about the couple's marital woes. Lutgert soon gave the neighbors even more to gossip about. One night, during another shouting match with Louisa, he responded to her indignation over his affair with Mary by taking his wife by the throat and choking her. Before she collapsed, Lutgert saw neighbors peering in at him from the parlor window of their home, and he released her. A few days later, Lutgert was seen chasing his wife down the street, he was shouting at her and waving a revolver. After a couple of blocks, Lutgert broke off the chase and walked silently back to the factory. Then, on May 1, 1897, Louisa disappeared. When questioned about it, Lutgert stated that Louisa had gone out the previous evening to visit her sister. After several days, though, she did not come back. Soon after, Dietrich Bicknies, Louisa's brother, came to Chicago and called on his sister. He was informed that she was not at home. He came back later, and finding Lutgert at home, he demanded to know where Louisa was. Lutgert calmly told him that Louisa had disappeared on May 1st and had never returned. 
When Diedrich demanded to know why Lutgert had not informed the police about Luisa's disappearance, the sausage maker simply told him that he was trying to avoid a scandal but that he had paid two detectives five dollars to try and find her. Diedrich immediately began searching for his sister. He went to Kankakee, thinking that perhaps she might be visiting friends there, but found no one who had seen her. He returned to Chicago, and when he found that Louisa still had not come home, worried and suspicious, Diedrich went to the police and spoke with Captain Herman Schutler. The detective and his men joined in the search for Louisa. They questioned neighbors and relatives and heard many recitations about the couple's violent arguments. They searched the alleys and dragged the river. They also went to the sausage factory and began questioning the employees. One of them, Wilhelm Fulpeck, recalled seeing Louisa around the factory at about 10.30 p.m. on May 1st. A young German girl named Emma Schimke passed by the factory with her sister at about the same time on that evening and remembered seeing Lutgert leading his wife up the alleyway behind the factory. Frank Bialk, a night watchman at the plant, confirmed both stories. He had also seen the couple at the sausage factory that night. Shortly after the couple entered the factory, Lutgert had come back outside, gave Bialk a dollar, and asked him to get him a bottle of celery compound from a nearby drugstore. When the watchman returned with the medicine, he was surprised to find the door leading into the main factory was locked. Lutgert appeared and took the medicine. He made no comment about the locked door and sent Bialk back to the engine room. A little while later, Lutgert again approached the watchman and sent him back to the drugstore to buy a bottle of medicinal spring water. While the watchman had been away running errands, Lutgert had apparently been working alone in the factory basement. He had turned on the steam under the middle vat a little before 9 p.m., and it was still running when Bialk returned. The watchman reported that Lutgert had remained in the basement until about 2 a.m. Bialk found him fully dressed in his office the next day. He asked whether the fires under the vat should be put out, and Lutgert told him to leave them burning, which was odd since the factory had been closed several weeks during Lutgert's financial reorganization. Bialk did as he was told, though, and went down to the basement. There, he saw a hose sending water into the middle of the vat and on the floor in front of it was a sticky, glue-like substance. Bialk noticed that it seemed to contain bits of bone, but he thought nothing of it. Lutgert used all sorts of waste meats to make his sausage and he assumed that this was all it was. On May 3rd, another employee, Frank Otorowski, also noticed the slimy substance on the factory floor. He feared that someone had boiled something in the factory without Lutgert's knowledge, so he went to his employer to report it. Lutgert told him not to mention the brown slime. If he kept silent, Lutgert said, he would have a good job for the rest of his life. Frank went to work, scraping the slime off the floor and poured it into a nearby drain that led to the sewer. The larger chunks of waste were placed in a barrel, and Lutgert told him to take the barrel out to the railroad tracks and scatter the contents there. Following these interviews, Schutler made another disturbing and suspicious discovery. A short time before Luisa's disappearance, even though the factory had been closed during the reorganization, Lutgert had ordered 325 pounds of crude potash and 50 pounds of arsenic from Lore Owen & Company, a wholesale drug firm. It was delivered to the factory the next day. Another interview with Frank Otorowski revealed the chemicals had been placed in the middle vat in the basement, heated, and turned to liquid. Captain Schutler decided that a search of the factory was needed. On May 15th, police officers began sorting through the 12-foot-long, 5-foot-deep middle vat that was two-thirds filled with a brownish, brackish liquid. The officers drained the greasy paste from the vat, using gunny sacks as filters, and began poking through the residue with sticks. It wasn't long before Officer Walter Dean found several pieces of bone and two gold rings. One of them was a badly tarnished friendship ring, and the other was a heavy gold band that had been engraved with the initials L.L. Louisa Lutgert had worn both of the rings. After they were analyzed, the bones were found to be definitely human. A third rib, part of an arm bone, a bone from the palm of a human hand, a bone from the fourth toe of a right foot, fragments of bone from a human ear and a larger bone from a foot. Adolf Ludgert, proclaiming his innocence, was arrested for the murder of his wife. 
Luis's body was never found, and there were no witnesses to the crime, but police officers and prosecutors believed the evidence was overwhelming. Lutgert was indicted for the crime a month later, and details of the murder shocked the city's residents, especially those on the northwest side. Even though Lutgert was charged with boiling his wife's body, local rumor had it that she'd been ground into sausage instead. Needless to say, sausage sales declined substantially in 1897. Lutgert's first trial ended with a hung jury on October 21st after the jurors failed to agree on a suitable punishment. Some argued for the death penalty, while others voted for life in prison. Only one of the jurors thought that Lutgert might be innocent. A second trial was held, and on February 9, 1898, Lutgert was convicted and sentenced to a life term at Joliet Prison. He was taken away, still maintaining his innocence and claiming that he would receive another trial. He was placed in charge of meats in the prison's cold storage warehouse, and officials described him as a model inmate. By 1899, though, Lutgert began to speak less and less, and often quarreled with the other convicts. He soon became a shadow of his former blustering persona, fighting for no reason and often babbling incoherently in his cell at night. His mind had been broken, either from guilt over his heinous crime or from the brutal conditions of his imprisonment. Lutgert died in 1900, likely from heart trouble. The coroner who conducted the autopsy also reported that his liver was greatly enlarged and in such a condition of degeneration that mental strain would have caused his death at any time. But legends followed Lutgert to his death. Stories claimed that Luisa's ghost had her revenge on the man who killed her. Toward the end of his life, Lutgert allegedly claimed that Luisa visited his cell at night, haunting him for causing her death. Was she really haunting him, or was the ghost just a figment of a rapidly deteriorating mind? Was he already insane, or had Luisa driven him out of his mind? Lutgert died under what the coroner called great mental strain, so perhaps Luisa did manage to get her revenge after all. But if Luisa's ghost did return to haunt her husband, it's not the only place where her spirit walked. The old sausage factory has been turned into condominiums, and the Lutgert house has been gone for years, but the story of the infamous crime that kept people from eating sausages in the summer of 1897 lingers on. And so does Luisa. Not long after her husband was sent to prison, her ghost began to be seen inside the Lutgert house. Neighbors claimed to see a woman in a white dress leaning against the fireplace mantel. Eventually, the house was rented out, but none of the tenants stayed there long. The place became an object of fear, the yard overgrown with ragweed and largely deserted. It was torn down many years ago. Even so, Luisa refuses to rest in peace. Legend has it that she still walks every year on May 1st, crossing the street from where her house once stood at the corner of Hermitage and Diversey and vanishing into the building where her life was lost. So, if you happen to be on the northwest side of Chicago some early May and see a pretty, lonely-looking woman in old-fashioned clothing crossing the street in front of you, be sure to slow down and perhaps lift a hand in greeting to a woman who died too soon. Gilbert Gill Mark Gilman, 47, went for a short walk in Olympic National Park in Washington on Saturday, June 24, 2006, and never came back. He went to the trailhead of the Staircase Rapid Loop Trail to take some photos, not for a serious hike. He was dressed in light clothes and shoes, and he wasn't carrying a backpack. Gilman parked his car at the Staircase Ranger Station and had a brief conversation with Park Ranger Sandy Lustig. This was the last time anyone saw him. Despite an extensive 10-day search, no trace of Gill was ever found. In the many years since, no evidence of his disappearance has turned up. Some people wonder if Gill wanted to disappear and work secretly for the U.S. government if he was murdered by a serial killer, or if something happened to him in Olympic National Park. 
Gill was 5 foot 7 and weighed 155 to 165 pounds with graying brown hair and brown eyes. On the day he disappeared, he wore a bright blue and green Hawaiian shirt, khaki pants or shorts, sandals, and prescription sunglasses. Gill was a tough and smart guy, having been a U.S. Army paratrooper. He served in Panama, East Africa, and Israel and had combat experience with the 82nd Airborne Division, earning two Bronze Stars. He had degrees from the London School of Economics, Union College in New York, and Solvay Business School in Brussels. Gill also worked as a military interrogator in Iraq and took assignments in counterterrorism and counterintelligence. He was fluent in Arabic, Russian, and Chinese. Before moving to Washington State, Gill worked for the United Nations in New York. He moved to manage the 2004 congressional campaign for Sandy Matheson, director of the state's Department of Retirement Systems. He became her deputy director in April 2005, advising on national and local pension issues. Ranger Sandy Lustig saw Gill on June 24, 2006, carrying a camera but no backpack. Sandy said, I could actually hear the music playing in his car and went out to see what was going on, and I had a brief conversation with him and asked him to turn down the music. I got the sense he was going for a hike. The staircase area of Olympic National Park is about 30 minutes from Hoodsport in a lowland old-growth forest. It has a seasonal ranger station, a campground, and the trailhead for the North Fork Skokomish River Trail. The Staircase Rapid Loops Trail is a 2.1-mile, relatively flat loop through 300- to 400-year-old Douglas firs, western hemlocks, and western red cedars. The trail follows the North Fork Skokomish River with mossy trees, ferns, and a suspension bridge crossing the river. Gill was supposed to go to a meeting in Spokane, Washington with Sandy Matheson on Sunday, June 25, 2006. When he didn't show up, he was reported missing. His 2005 Ford Thunderbird convertible was found at the Staircase Ranger Station. Searchers looked for 10 days using tracking dogs, a helicopter, a plane with heat-seeking equipment, and 62 searchers on the ground. They found no trace of him. After 10 days, the search was called off. His mother, Doris Gilman, said, "...it's hard to imagine a person can just disappear. Nothing was ever found." Gill was declared legally dead on August 27, 2015. To be presumed dead in Washington state, the person must be missing and not heard from for at least seven years. Some people think Gill might have become a spy for the U.S. government or was a victim of serial killer Israel Keyes. Keyes was linked to 11 murders from 2001 to 2012. However, in March 2014, FBI Special Agent Kevin Donovan said Keyes was unlikely to be involved in Gilman's disappearance based on evidence and reviews of unsolved cases. Nonetheless, the theory remains interesting. And Gill remains missing. When Weird Darkness returns, centuries of worship and tragedy have left behind more than just memories in some churches. They've also left behind spirits, some holy, some not. From ghostly priests and weeping brides to mysterious mists and phantom lights, there are hauntings that linger in these ancient sanctuaries. What eerie tales are hidden within the walls of the world's oldest and most haunted churches? That story is up next. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee.
All over the world, there are churches that were built hundreds of years ago that still open their doors to the public. With all of the history contained in these sanctuaries, it's no surprise that a few ghost stories have developed over the centuries. From ancient cathedrals to historic chapels, these places are filled with stories of priests, parishioners, heretics, and those who have their final resting place in the adjacent graveyards. Here are some of the most famous haunted churches and the ghostly tales that surround them. Norwich Cathedral, located in England, began its construction in 1094 following the Norman invasion. Over a thousand years later, in 2015, tourist Kerry Launders captured an image of what appears to be a ghost bishop standing at the altar. Many believe this apparition is one of the bishops buried in the cathedral's floors. The most prominent ghost story from the Norwich Cathedral dates back to 1736, when the cathedral was already more than 600 years old. The ghost of a priest was seen at the cathedral's Eppringham Gate, believed to be Rev. Thomas Tunstall, a Catholic priest martyred at Norwich Cathedral. Tunstall had been drawn and quartered, and his remains were displayed around the city. Located in the French Quarter of New Orleans, St. Louis Cathedral is the oldest cathedral in the United States still in use. The first version was constructed in 1718, and the final version of the cathedral was completed in the 1850s. Due to its long history, St. Louis Cathedral has become home to several spirits. One of the most famous ghosts haunting the cathedral is Père Antoine, a priest who served there from 1774 until his death in 1829. Père Antoine famously baptized Marie Laveau, the voodoo queen of New Orleans, and later performed her first marriage. His spirit has been seen walking through an alleyway outside the church, quietly singing and looking in through the stained glass windows. The first recorded sighting of Antoine's ghost was in 1924. Other ghosts include Père Antoine's predecessor, Herr Dagobert, the pirate Jean Lafitte, and the infamous Delphine Lalaurie, though some question the legitimacy of Lalaurie sightings. Father Henry David Jardine, a controversial Episcopal priest, is believed to haunt his former congregation at St. Mary's Episcopal Church in Memphis. Jardine arrived at the church in 1879 when it was still St. Luke's mission. He caused controversy by introducing Catholic practices, and there was speculation about Jardine having a somewhat dubious past. In 1886, Jardine died in St. Louis from an apparent chloroform overdose, which the Episcopal Church ultimately deemed a suicide. As such, Jardine could not be buried at St. Mary's as he'd intended. In the years since his death, parishioners have smelled incense where there is none and seen a ghostly figure thought to be Jardine looking out one of the second-floor windows. During one paranormal investigation, an electromagnetic field detector went off near the altar, and the apparition of a priest was caught on film. The spirit is believed to be Jardine. In 2000, Jardine's body was moved to St. Mary's, and his final resting place sits below the church's altar. In 1918, a young woman was seen pacing the steps of the First Church of Christ Scientist located at the corner of 3rd and Ornsby in Louisville, Kentucky. More than a century later, it is said that her ghost is still seen pacing and sobbing during the night. This ghost is known as the Lady of the Stairs, or Miss G. It's believed that Miss G was a member of the prominent Gathright family and that her parents attempted to marry her to a much older man after she graduated from high school. However, Miss G had already fallen in love with a young man who was fighting in World War I. After the war, the soldier, believed to be Herbert Fullerton Dixon, returned to Louisville, and the young couple planned to leave town and get married in Chicago. Tragically, the night they were to leave, Miss G went to the steps of the First Church of Christ Scientist, where she and Dixon regularly met. Sadly, Dixon never showed up. He had come down with the Spanish flu and was unable to make it to the church, but the news never reached Miss G. In a matter of days, both Dixon and Miss G had died from the flu, and Miss G's spirit has been seen on the church steps ever since. The construction of St. Bartholomew the Great Church began in 1120. Located in what is now West Smithfield, a monk and Norman courtier named Raher 
received land and funds from King Henry I to build the church. St. Bart's is a dark history, with several murders and executions taking place on the grounds, including the burning of heretics. Today, several resident ghosts and unnamed entities reside within the church walls. The Duke of Argyle, the painter William Hogarth, and the apparition of a priest have been seen in the church. A white mist appears in the center aisle of St. Bart's, sometimes forming into the shape of a woman. This positive energy is countered by a black mist thought to be a residual negative energy from the violence at St. Bart's. The church's most famous ghost is Raher himself. The monk has been seen wandering the church, supposedly looking for his foot, which was allegedly stolen from his crypt centuries after his death. His ghost appears on the first day of every July at 7 a.m. Constructed between 1882 and 1885, Most Holy Trinity in Brooklyn, along with its adjoining school and rectory, is believed to be extremely haunted. In 1897, church sexton George Stells was murdered in the church, but his killer was never caught. Since then, a bloody handprint has occasionally appeared on the wall leading up to the bell tower. The school, built in 1887 on the site of the church's graveyard, is suspected of having bodies remain beneath it, despite claims that they were moved. Lights in the gymnasium turn on and off by themselves, and footsteps are heard when the gym is empty. The rectory is also the site of paranormal activity. Monsignor Michael May's former bedroom is rarely used due to his ghost making noises throughout the night. Dogs visiting the rectory have stared at the main staircase even though no one appears to be there. Bricked over passageways in the basement might have been part of the Underground Railroad, adding to the mystery. The Chapel of the Cross in Madison, Mississippi was commissioned by Margaret Johnstone in 1852 following her husband's death. In 1859, Margaret's daughter Helen was to be wed at the chapel, but her fiancé was killed in a duel shortly before the wedding. This tragic history has led to hauntings on the property. Helen Johnstone, known as the Bride of Annansdale, has been seen walking through the church's graveyard and crying near her fiancé's grave. Margaret Johnstone's also said to haunt the graveyard known as the Weeping Lady. Other apparitions include a young couple seen climbing into a tree and young children. Inside the church, the massive pipe organ has been heard playing by itself. St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Cheyenne, Wyoming is the state's oldest church, built in 1868. The beautiful stone church holds a tragic past. During the construction of St. Mark's, two Swedish immigrants were hired to complete the masonry for the bell tower. One fell to his death in the basement of the bell tower, and the other, fearing no one would believe the fall was an accident, buried him within the walls before fleeing the state. In the 1920s, when the bell tower was finally completed, workers reported hearing a disembodied voice saying, there is a body in the wall. The church rector believed the bell tower was haunted and had a special room built for the ghost. People have continued to report hearing the voice of the Swedish mason since the bell tower's completion. St. Andrew's on the Red Anglican Church in Selkirk, Manitoba is the oldest stone church still operating in Western Canada. Built between 1845 and 1849, one of the most well-known hauntings is a woman in white seen in the graveyard. Parishioners and ghost hunters have also seen a man in black lurking in the graveyard and a phantom car that suddenly appears and disappears. A pair of red eyes float between the headstones, and the sound of nails being driven into a coffin is heard. Those who have paranormal encounters at the church often report having vivid nightmares, with the sounds of chains rattling against the locked cemetery gates being a common theme. Located in Kent, England, the village of Pluckley is considered one of the most haunted villages in England. St. Nicholas Church, dating back to 1090 AD, is notably haunted. Inside the church, an orb of light has been seen near the crypt of the Daring family who oversaw the village for centuries. Knocking has been heard coming from the crypt, and the spirit known as the White Lady, thought to be a Daring family member, has been witnessed. Outside the church, the apparition of the Red Lady and a dog have been seen in the churchyard. During a paranormal investigation in the 1970s, a ghost dog is believed to have visited those conducting the investigation. 
Located at 401 Duval Street in Key West, the current St. Paul's Episcopal Church is the fourth iteration on the property, with previous versions destroyed by hurricanes and fires. The size of the current church led to many bodies being moved to Key West Cemetery, but at least six graves remain. One of the most prominent is John Fleming, who donated the land for the church. His headstone is built into one of the church walls, and his ghost appears as a misty figure near his final resting place. Other hauntings in the church graveyard include the spirit of a sea captain, Thomas Mann Randolph, who terrorizes visitors and ghostly children standing around an angel statue. These stories of haunted churches remind us of the deep history and the many lives that have passed through these sacred places. Whether you believe in ghosts or not, the tales do add an extra layer of mystery and intrigue to these ancient sanctuaries. Up next on Weird Darkness, he was a charismatic activist and local celebrity who counted the elite of Philadelphia among his friends. But behind closed doors, Ira Einhorn's relationship with his girlfriend Holly Maddox was fraught with abuse, control, and ultimately murder. The shocking discovery of Holly's body in a trunk in Einhorn's apartment was only the beginning of the hunt for the man they would eventually call the Unicorn Killer. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. In the 1970s, Ira Einhorn was a well-known figure in Philadelphia's counterculture scene. Nicknamed the Unicorn, he was a charismatic activist, public speaker, and local celebrity who rubbed elbows with the city's elite. He had a network of wealthy benefactors, spoke at Ivy League universities, and was in a relationship with a beautiful young woman named Holly Maddox. But beneath Einhorn's enigmatic exterior lay a sinister secret, one that would lead to murder and spark a notorious international manhunt that spanned decades. Ira Einhorn was born in Philadelphia in 1940. As a student at the University of Pennsylvania in the 1960s, he became heavily involved in political activism, embracing the era's counterculture and anti-war movements. Einhorn quickly rose as an outspoken leader in these circles. He landed a teaching position at Temple University in 1964 but was let go after just one year when he openly expressed his contempt for the academic world and admitted to encouraging students to experiment with drugs like marijuana and LSD. Undeterred, Einhorn cultivated his image as a countercultural guru. He adopted the nickname the Unicorn, a reference to both the mythical creature's air of magic and mystery and the German translation of his last name, which means one horn. Einhorn became known as Philadelphia's official hippie, attracting a devoted following drawn to his unconventional ideas and magnetic personality. He also garnered the financial backing of numerous wealthy supporters who were taken by his eccentric charm. 
In 1972, the then 32-year-old Einhorn began a relationship with Holly Maddox, a beautiful and bright 21-year-old graduate of Bryn Mawr College. Despite their contrasting appearances, Einhorn with his wild hair and unkempt beard, Maddox with her all-American good looks, the couple quickly fell for each other, moving in together just two weeks after meeting. I was immediately attracted to her, Einhorn later said. She had a strange, lost quality about her, and I was probably collecting lost people at that time. Over the five years Einhorn and Maddox were together, their relationship grew increasingly volatile and dysfunctional. Einhorn became extremely possessive and controlling. Friends noticed that Holly would show up to work with visible injuries like black eyes and bruises on her neck and arms, telltale signs of physical abuse. You have to have the purpose of hurting someone in order to inflict those injuries, recalled Holly's friend, Meg Wakeman. By 1977, Holly had enough. She left Einhorn and moved to New York City where she became romantically involved with another man. An enraged Einhorn relentlessly pressured her to return to Philadelphia, ostensibly to collect her remaining belongings. Against her better judgment and the warnings of concerned friends, Holly made the trip on September 9, 1977. It was the last time anyone would see her alive. In the 18 months following Holly Maddox's disappearance, her distraught family hired private investigators to find her. But Einhorn refused to cooperate with their efforts. He claimed Holly had simply gone out to buy tofu and sprouts at the neighborhood co-op one day and never came back. All the while, Einhorn carried on with his life, attending high society parties, lecturing at prestigious universities like Harvard, and continuing to build his network of influential contacts. However, Einhorn couldn't keep the truth hidden forever. Neighbors began complaining of a horrible stench like that of decaying flesh emanating from his apartment. Others noticed a strange brownish liquid oozing through the ceiling. Einhorn refused to let workers enter his home to investigate the source of the foul odor and mysterious ooze. Suspicious, authorities obtained a search warrant. On March 28, 1979, police entered Einhorn's apartment. There, in a locked steamer trunk hidden in the closet, they made a horrific discovery – the severely decomposed body of Holly Maddox, beaten to death. After 18 months in the trunk, her mummified remains weighed a mere 37 pounds. The coroner determined her skull had been shattered by repeated blows. Einhorn was arrested, but in a stunning turn of events, he was able to post bail with the financial help of a wealthy Canadian socialite supporter. Out on bond, Einhorn spun wild stories, accusing large intelligence agencies of murdering Holly and planting her body in his apartment to frame him for the crime. Then, as his trial date approached in 1981, Einhorn fled the country. He hopscotched through Europe, eventually settling in France with a Swedish woman named Annika Floden whom he met and married. For years, the couple lived there under assumed names. Resolute in their pursuit of justice for Holly Maddox, Philadelphia prosecutors made the rare move of trying Einhorn in absentia, without his presence in court. In 1996, 15 years after Einhorn became an international fugitive, a Pennsylvania jury convicted him of first-degree murder and sentenced him to life in prison with no possibility of parole. Einhorn's years on the run finally came to an end in 1997, when the French police, acting on a tip from Einhorn's ex-supporter, arrested him in the town of Champagne-Mouton. However, France initially refused to extradite Einhorn back to the United States, citing the conviction in absentia as a violation of his human rights under French law. Einhorn fought his return for several years, but France ultimately agreed to extradite him in 2001 after the Pennsylvania legislature passed a law allowing him to request a retrial. The law became known as the Einhorn Law. More than two decades after bludgeoning Holly Maddox to death and stuffing her body in a steamer trunk, 62-year-old Ira Einhorn finally faced justice in a Philadelphia courtroom in 2002. At the retrial, Einhorn continued to maintain his innocence, insisting Maddox had been murdered by government agents. However, the jury rejected his conspiracy theories. During the trial, one of Einhorn's ex-girlfriends, Judith Sabat, 
provided chilling testimony about his history of violence and abuse. Sabat described an incident from the 1960s when Einhorn smashed her over the head with a bottle and tried to strangle her. I felt and believed I was dying, she recalled. I believed that this was it. On October 17, 2002, Ira Einhorn was once again found guilty of the first-degree murder of Holly Maddox. He received an automatic sentence of life in prison with no chance of parole. Einhorn would spend the next 18 years behind bars until his death from natural causes on April 3, 2020, at the age of 79. The tragic case of Holly Maddox, a promising young woman whose life was brutally cut short by her abusive and controlling boyfriend, set shockwaves through Philadelphia society and garnered national attention. Ira Einhorn, for all his charisma and influential connections, was unmasked as a vicious killer who evaded accountability for his crimes for more than 20 years. While Holly's heartbroken family had to endure an excruciatingly long wait for justice, Einhorn ultimately could not outrun the consequences of his actions. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories on Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories, authors, and sources I used in the episode notes. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 John 1 verses 5 through 7. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. And a final thought. Make the most of the present moment. No occasion is unworthy of our best efforts. God often uses the humble occasions and little things to shape the course of a man's life. James Garfield I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Hey weirdos, be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com listen.